really put her shoes. For Ellen Smith, who runs the Burton Morgan Foundation program. If you are not familiar, familiar with the entrepreneurship and small business series, I recommend you pick up. We have a few programs left until through May on small business and entrepreneurship. This is one in the whole series this winter that she put together. If you want to be on our gate, uh, email mailing list to be apprised of Kurt Morgan uh, programming. It will start again in the fall. Give us your email on these evaluations. We also would love for you to fill out this evaluation after the program because it really helps inform us for the programming that you want to do. So we'd love to hear from you. In addition to uh, the resources you're going to hear about uh, today for grant writing, we also have a lot of other databases if you're interested in doing research to inform yourself, to uh, prepare a grant, uh, for, or for just for your small business or organization. Make sure you pick up one of these because we have a lot of databases that you pay for indirectly through your they're very valuable for small businesses. So this is another resource for you. In addition, related to uh, the databases for foundations, Allison and I will be teaching a class on Saturday. We have eight seats open to teach you uh, uh, just uh, the first steps into doing the research for grant writing uh, to identify resources. Most databases that you'll hear about uh, from our speaker. Only eight seats left. It is free, but time to leave. You can go to HudsonLibrary.org under Adult Programs and you'll find a tab to register for that class. It's 10 o'clock, right? 10 to 12 on Saturday. And David Holmes, we are really lucky to have David here because he's located in Cleveland. I've been detail on what you fill you in. But we're lucky because we're now a Foundation Center library and we're right down the road from the office, the Cleveland office. So David has been a really good resource for us and therefore for you. So I'm going to let David Holmes take over because he's got lots of things. Thanks for coming. I am Dave, Dave Holmes. I am the currently I'm the acting director of the Foundation Center Cleveland. Uh, those of you who don't know what the Foundation Center, how many do know what the Foundation Center is? Okay, so if you don't know, we are a national nonprofit. The Foundation Center started about 50 years ago or so. We were certified foundations because they were getting challenged by the government about where does your money go and what are you doing with your money. And they wanted an organization that would help them become more transparent, would share information about what they give money for, who they give it to exactly, how does it work, and how do you approach them to get to them. And that's how the Foundation Center started, and we've been doing that for over 50 years, collecting information on private grant makers. That's foundations, corporations, charities that give money away. We collect information on them, we make it freely available to people. We, also, we sell access to a database of this, which I will talk about today. Uh, but it's also something that we make freely available at this library and our other partner libraries across the country. It's called the Foundation Directory. And that's what the class is going to be on Saturday, learn, teaching you how to, to use that. We collect information that way. We also teach classes like this. Uh, we have a whole schedule of classes all around Northeast Ohio. We do a lot in our office in downtown Cleveland. It's in the Hanna Building. But we also do classes throughout all of our partner libraries, what we call our funding information network. And that's this library, Twinsburg Public Library, uh, Akron County Public Library. There are many throughout this area. And I'll show you where you can find more about them. We collect this information, we teach classes, we also collect additional information on helping you run your nonprofit more effectively, fundraise for your nonprofit, get grants, learn how to write grant proposals, learn how to put a fundraising plan together, we do regular trainings, we have lots of materials, and I will show you some places where you can go to use our resources for free online. Um, I am, as I said, the director of the library. I'm, I, before that, I was a grant writer. And before that, I worked as a program officer for a foundation up in Wayne County. And I've kind of seen it from all sorts of different perspectives. So what I'm going to teach tonight is proposal writing basics. This is 
based on a book that we published called The Guide to Proposal Writing, which is uh, put together by a woman named Jane Deeper. What Jane does is sit down with grant makers and ask them, how do you like to be approached? How do you like information to be presented to you? Are you doing it electronically? Are you doing it in person? How is this happening? And she compiles that, and we put this class together based on that, just to give you an idea of how to best fundraise for your organization, how to do a grant proposal. So I'm going to take you through that. But first of all, I want two things. One is I want to pass around. We have an, an e-newsletter out of the Foundation Center's offices. It's different from the one that you might get from here about the Burton D. Morgan collection. I'm very grateful, by the way, for, for uh, everyone at the library for bringing me down and, and doing this program. But if you are interested in finding out more about our classes, if you want to make sure that you don't miss anything that we're doing, we have full day classes, we have scholarships for those that we announce, and we also have opportunities to meet grant makers. If you want that, just add your name and email to this list. If you don't want it, just keep passing it along. And what I'm also going to do is just ask you all to introduce yourself, just say who you are and what organization you're Sure. My name's George Brunner, I'm with the Akron SCORE organization. Okay, great. Yeah, if you could uh, project, you can you don't say that. My name is Carol Holland. I'm the president of US Work, and we are a private for profit company.
Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. So I'm going to get into this. And just a couple of things about me. I just keep talking unless you have a question. So please do raise your hand, or I'm just going to drone on and on. Secondly, I only have one eye. So if you can't tell if I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you. That's, I'm going to make that as clear as humanly possible from here. Right, but I do want to make sure that we go through this and, and get you what you need to know about proposal writing. We are going to take it back to the beginning. I know some of you have some experience with this, or you're just learning it, reviewing it. But I want to talk about the things you have to have in place before you get started. Some of the things you have to consider uh, working with a nonprofit, or if you're doing this uh, independently or as a consultant. Some of the other things related to organizing the proposal, making sure that it, you have everything you need to put it together. And I hope everybody got uh, at your place should have been a little handout with slides. And on the back is a little example that I'm going to go through. So make sure that you get that. And there are some extras in the back if you didn't. We'll talk about submitting the proposal and what happens next. I'm also going to talk about the relationship building. If you've written grant proposals and maybe you wrote for government or maybe you, you just did a few and you didn't really get into the relationship building that's involved in this, this is not just about writing the best essay you've ever written and sending it in and waiting for the money to come back. This is about building a relationship with a potential funder and making sure that you are available for that and you're presenting yourself in the best way and making the connections. Because even if you don't get funded, even if you send in and do everything right or as, as you thought and you don't get funded, you don't want to just leave it there. You don't want to start from scratch every time you write a grant proposal. You want to have a relationship with the most likely funders and you want to be able to go back to them and ask them, why didn't you fund this or can we come to you for this? So I will be talking about that as we go through and hopefully addressing all those kind of things. First thing I want to talk about is getting started. Um, the first question I ask people, we, I work at the Foundation Center uh, Library up in Cleveland, and people walk in all the time. Actually, what happens is they walk into the Cleveland Foundation downstairs from us, and they say, I heard you guys have money. I wanted to get a grant. And they talk to them for a while. And if they can help them, they can help them. If they can't, they say, well, you want to go up to the library. And that's us. We're a separate organization. And we talk to the person. And the first question we ask is, are you a nonprofit? Are you working with a nonprofit organization? And we ask that because the private foundations and the way the law is written for private grant making kind of require their giving to go to not-for-profit organizations, 501c3s, which are public charities, or some other kind of not-for-profit, like a hospital or a school. There are some foundations who will give to organizations that are not nonprofits as long as they partner with nonprofits in what's called a fiscal sponsorship. But there are very few that will give directly to individuals. Mostly when they do that, they give for scholarships. So if you're looking for money to start a for-profit business or to, or to pay for things like that, foundations are really not the best track for that. They're just not going to fund that. So we do ask about that process and whether you're partnering with somebody or if you're thinking about doing it and get, try to figure out where you are in the process and help you get to a place where it makes sense for you to look for grants. But the other thing that's in, in that sentence is the credible part. When you're thinking about applying for a grant, from a foundation, you have to realize that you're going to be in competition with lots and lots of other nonprofits. Everybody is putting together their best arguments for why they should be funded. And it's going to the foundation. Foundation I work for, we would get probably about 100 grant proposals every three months. And we couldn't fund all of those. We could fund about 60 of them. And these weren't from strangers. These were from organizations that we knew about and people that we knew were doing good in the community. But what we had to think about was what made this grant proposal more credible than another. And it hinged on what do you do for the community that's indispensable? What do you do that nobody else does? What vital service are you providing that isn't otherwise being provided? If you have to be able to answer that question, what makes you indispensable, because that's Funders are always looking for ways that they can be the most economical, help the most people, do the most good. So what makes you credible? Is it, is it uh, demand from the community? Is it something that you're giving the community that nobody else can do? What is it? So keep that in the back of your mind. Funders are going to be thinking about that when they, they consider your grant proposal. The other things you have to consider are the kind of support that you need. I don't know if you've written grant proposals before. There's a, there's a demand. It would be wonderful. You could just write a letter and say, you know, here's what I do. Isn't it great? Send me as much money as you can spare. You know, that would be the easiest way to put a grant proposal together. It doesn't work that way. Funders like to know, 
exactly what their money is going to be spent on. And they like to be, as it, to be as clear as possible. So a lot of them don't like to give what's called general operating or unrestricted money. They like projects. They like this starts now, ends now, costs this much money, takes this long. And so if you're looking for something other than project support, though, it's, it's a little bit harder to find. And you have to be clear about that, because there are fewer funders that are going to give for general operating funds. There are fewer that are going to give to buy equipment or building and renovation funds. So you have to be very clear. What is this money going to go towards specifically related to my program? And the last thing you have to consider is whether or not you have enough time. I don't know if anybody's told you before, but foundations do not generally get back to you by return mail with the money that you need. It's going to take some time. It's going to take time where they get your application, they review it, they talk to you, maybe they make a site visit, they organize and get a lot of recommendations together, and then they meet, and the trustees decide who gets grants. And that can be a regular process, happens every couple of months. It can be something that happens once a year, and maybe it happened yesterday. And you think, well, there's no deadline that they have, I'll just send it in whenever, and then I'll just wait for the money. What, six weeks, I would figure. You know, it doesn't always work that way. Know that foundations all have different deadlines. There's no requirement that they even have a deadline. There's no requirement that they have regular meetings. So think and try and find out from any foundations that you research, when are they likely to get me the money? And know that they don't want to pay for things that have already happened. So the, mes the message is plan as far in advance as possible if you're going to approach foundations. If you can plan a year in advance, you don't eliminate any from consideration in general because they have to give out a certain amount per year and they go for that. But the closer you get to real soon, it's like asking for a college scholarship. By now, a lot of the college scholarships for this fall are gone, you know, or they're very close to being gone. So if you had planned a little bit earlier, looked a little bit further in advance, you'd have more chance. It's very similar with foundations. Other parts of planning before we get into the writing. You have to gather information in-house. If you're working with a nonprofit, you have to have, first of all, your board has to be on board. They have to know what you're fundraising for. It's very dangerous to just say, OK, there's all this money over here. This foundation just said they have all this money for this type of project. Let's do that and, and go after the money that way. It should be something that when you go to a foundation, you're going to them because they match up with you based on what you are set up to do, your mission, and what they support. And funders look for that. They look for when they think you're coming after the money and changing around what your essential, the essential part of yourself to get it. They know that. They see that as mission drift or mission creep. They don't like it because it means that you won't take it as seriously. They want you to go after money if it fits with the mission, if they match with you. The word that they use all the time is fit. And you will hear that again and again if you talk to a foundation. It's a good fit. I, I don't see how this is a good fit for us. They're always looking at what you do and what they do and looking for that fit. It's your board's job to make sure that you're focused on fundraising for the specific things that are closest to your mission. And it's your job, as somebody who may be writing this grant proposal, to work with everybody in your organization who's going to be doing the work. I really recommend that you have at least one meeting with everybody who's going to be involved. Because what happens is it's not everybody who's writing a grant proposal. I got hired as the director of grants and prospect research at a college. And they told me, well, you know, you're not really writing all the grant proposals. You're just assembling them. You know, other people will give you this. No, I was writing them. I was getting stuff, and it wasn't in any shape. And I was, there was one person, me, I found out, putting them all together. And that's what happens. It's usually one or at the most two people that really are in, in charge of getting the argument together. But there's usually lots and lots of people doing the work. So you don't want the person writing the grant proposal explaining to somebody how you are going to be doing all this work if you don't know that's the work you're supposed to be doing. Everybody in-house should be on the same page when it comes to what time frame are we talking about? Is it this year? Is it a summer? Is it a school year? What is the time frame we, we are expecting? And within that, what do we want to get done? What specific things? How many times are we offering this? How many sessions? How many different people are we going to serve? In order to do that within that time frame, what's it going to cost? Everybody should be in the same place. And 
I worked at a college, I know that there were people with great ideas, but they didn't really know like how much a mailing costs. How much is a mailing? And it's the person who does the mailing, it's that administrative person who should have been in the meeting for that because they will tell you how much a mailing costs. Well, is it going to be in an envelope? Is it going to be separate? Are we going to fold it over? Are we going to paste it? Is it going to be nonprofit rate? How thick is this? Are we printing it in-house? All these questions that other people don't really want to deal with. But it's the difference between cost of a mailing that's $1,000 and cost of a mailing that's $5,000. What you don't want to do is put together a budget guess at a lot of different numbers, write a grant proposal, and get all the funding that you ask for and not have enough to do it. Because then you have to go back and apologize and ask for an extension, and it's bad. So the closer you get to a good budget number, you won't be perfect, the closer you get to the real costs within this time frame to get these outcomes, the better off you're going to be. I'm not going to show you how to do the researching in this class because there is a session this Saturday, and I hope you will sh sign up for it. We have a database, as I mentioned, called the Foundation Directory Online. It's something we sell access to, and if you want to get it from home, it's anywhere from $20 a month up to $180 a month. But if you want to use it for free, you can come to our library at the Foundation Center in Cleveland, or you can come here and use it for free. And I just want to show you real quickly a little bit about that. If you want to come and use it here, and let's just do Hudson Library here. You can come in, you don't have to make an appointment, and you can go to the computers and get some help from the reference department, and they will set you up. But there's a research, list of research databases that they have here if you come in the library. And one of them is a link to grants and grant seeking, and that's where the Foundation Center material is, and Foundation Center Online, the Foundation Center's database. It's free here but you can't use it outside for free. This is where you would go, and I encourage you to, to take a look. If you can't find it, come on in and they'll show you how to do it. But this is where you would go to find matches between what you are doing and what the funders are that are searching. Question here. Um, is this available Yes, and at the end I'll show you. It's at the Akron Summit County Public Library main branch as well. I'll show you at the very end where you can find all the places around here to access this. But generally, what you're trying to do is find that match. I mentioned you know, that funders are looking for a fit between what they're doing and what you're doing. You're looking to find the funders that you fit with based on these things, based on what you do. And you can be really narrow. You, know, you have a service where you're working with kids with autism, so you're going to look for all the funders that are interested in autism. And you'll find a few hundred. But the thing is, that's not all the funders who are likely to fund your program. You want to find funders that maybe that give for health or children's health or children's issues because it's linked to the kind of things that you do. So whenever you start to try and find a potential fit, think of all the different ways that you serve. You know, here's a program. It's an after-school program. It's serving youth. It's youth development-related program. It's educational. It's recreational. It helps the kids of Hudson, so it's for people that are interested in developing the community. Think of all the different ways that you can match up with a potential funder based on the kind of things that they care about. These are funders, for the most part, that made their money around here and want to give back to the community. They're interested in helping specific things within the community, so they're looking for these kind of matches, too. You're trying to show how do you match up with them geographically? You know, do you serve the area that they care about? And most of the funders in our database, there's about 138, 139,000 funders in this database, most of them have a specific area of interest, a geographic region that they give to because that's where they grew up, or that's where their trustees live, or that's where the person made the money. They want to go back and help it. So they find funders that match up with you by what they're interested in, by where they give, and as I mentioned earlier, what the money can be used for, the type of support. All of those things are important, and the Foundation Directory Online is the database. It's free here. I'll show you later on where else you can find it free. But it's a very good way of finding possibilities. And, I'll sh and I'm not going to show you how it's organized, but I'll tell you. We collect information on the things they fund, other people they've given money to. We collect information on how they describe what they're interested in. And we collect contact information, phone numbers, if we can get them. Otherwise, the initial approach, how do you go to them if you've never gone to them before? And that's very important, because it's not all the same thing. Some of them say, online form, fill out our online form. 
Some funders don't have any online form or electronics. Send us a letter, a letter of inquiry, a short version of your grant proposal. Some of them say, call us first. What I encourage people to do, because the relationship is so important, is if they publish a phone number, I encourage you to make a phone call as a first approach. Doesn't always work, I'll tell you. There are some that don't have phones, some that ask you where you got the number, you know, those kind of things. But you want to try and make a personal connection with the, the foundation. The easiest way to do that is to pick up the phone and call them, not randomly, not, hey, I heard you have money. I need money, you know, not that. But here's what we do. Here's why I think you'll be interested. Because I guarantee you, the first question that's running through their head, even if they don't say it, is, why are you calling me? So explain why you're calling them. Because of your interest in education, I thought I would call you and tell you about a program that's going to serve 5,700 kids in greater Cleveland. Would you be interested in getting, learning more about this by my submitting a proposal? That's the kind of thing that you would want to do. And you'll hear the word no. Trust me, you will hear the word no. If you, won't, you shouldn't get into fundraising if you can't deal with the word no. But the thing is, do you want to hear the word no before you write the 10-page grant proposal or after? So hear it early, and you don't have to write the 10-page grant proposal. You can go to somebody else. But if you hear, oh, that sounds interesting, when you write the 10-page grant proposal, you can say in your cover letter, thanks for talking to me and encouraging me to submit this proposal. I knew you'd be interested, or I hoped you'd be interested. You can relate to them and remind them that they've already encouraged you a little bit. So think about that as you, as you begin to build the relationship. Let's imagine you made this phone call, you called 10 different funders, and five of them said, submit a grant proposal. Now, I know you were thinking, I only want to send this to one, <laughs> if possible. But chances are you're going to have to go to more than one. They are unlikely to give you the entire amount. We'll talk more about that. Question here. Back in your planning and uh, collection of data, yeah. what do you before you write a grant proposal? Right. Before you submit? I would say... To plan and collect all the data? To plan and collect all the data? I would say that you want to have as much data as possible, at least outlined, kind of like the way we would have on this example, before you begin to approach any foundations. And it's helpful to do that a couple weeks in advance, at least. Another question here. Yeah, he's asking, if I lived in a different county, would I ask for money from foundations that are in Cleveland, for example? I worked in Lorain County. We got lots of requests from Cleveland-based nonprofits and vice versa. The important thing is not where you are. It's where the people are that you're going to serve. If I have a school that's on the border, I should know where, how many are coming from one county and how many are coming from another. Different funders draw the lines different ways. So don't assume when one says Northeast Ohio, that the, that's the same definition of Northeast Ohio that others have. But find out if they'd be interested, you know? And the more you know about the number you serve from the area they're in, the better off you are. Okay. Let's imagine you have this conversation. Five of them ask you to send a grant proposal. You don't want to write from scratch a grant proposal five times. What you want to do is have at least some sort of order, some sort of structure that you can modify. So I recommend writing a model grant proposal, something that you can modify. You have it all written out with all the different content that you're going to need. And for this funder that wants it five pages, and this one wants it 20 pages, and this one wants a one page summary, you can pull it from that without having to go back from scratch all the time. This is an outline for a typical grant proposal. It's not going to fit every bill, but it has all the things that you would usually need. Title page, table of contents, executive summary, and I'll go through all these different sections. The narrative, which is the main part of the grant proposal, the story. Here's the need that I've identified. Here's our project. Here's a little bit about our organization. Here's a one-page budget. It's usually one page. And then here's all the appendices and supporting materials. I have some advice about writing grant proposals before I get into it, outline it just like you did back in English class. It's a good idea. I mean, it's, people are resistant to this because, you know, it's, I would just rather just write. 
But if you do the outline, you know what's missing. You know what you have and know what you have to find. It also helps you get a lot more concise. Here are the most important things. You do an outline and you name your project. This one's called the Wisdom Exchange Project. It's having senior citizens tutor elementary school students in reading. It's exchanging their wisdom. It's kind of cutesy, kind of corny, but it's memorable. And you know, you know, it's wisdom exchange. Oh, they're exchanging. Oh, it's the senior project. I remember that. You're going to be talking to a bunch of people in house and out of house about this. You want them to remember it. If you start describing, you know, what's your grant for? Oh, it's about expanding the services of our organization to the greater Hudson area. And then people don't remember that. People remember this clear link. And that's what you should concentrate on when you're doing this. Don't think that you are writing uh, a dissertation or a paper or an, even an article where you have to cite everything perfectly. You should cite things, but whether you use MLA style or APA style really doesn't matter when it comes to a grant proposal. What's important is what is the story? That's what a grant proposal is. Here's a problem that I identified in the community. Here's what we're going to do to address that problem. Here's how it's going to go from beginning to end. Here's how much it's going to cost, and here's why it should be us. That's a grant proposal. Not more complicated than that. Remember who's reading it. Private foundations, the ones that we deal with most, most of them are independent foundations, otherwise known as family foundations. The people who decide who gets a grant aren't a panel of experts drawn from across the world. They're a family. They're like, think of your family. Are they all experts in what you do? This is them getting together, regular basis. And, and, it, and it holds for foundations you wouldn't even think. The Gun Foundation's been around for a long time. But if you look at the board members, this is all the Gun family. You know, there's a few brought in from outside, but for the most part, it's the guns still getting together and giving grants for the things they are interested in. Don't address it as if you are addressing strangers you know, that have this wild expertise and you can afford to be obscure and try and impress them with your knowledge. Tell them a clear story. Why should I care? What's going on in the community and what are you doing? Use action words, keep it clear and simple, and avoid things like jargon. If you work in academia or you work in any pursuit, I worked in youth development and I know the difference between juvenile justice and juvenile delinquency and resiliency and all these different terms that get thrown out. Try not to use them unless you explain them because you don't know that they're going to know them. You work with the government. The government has acronyms for everything. They invent new acronyms daily. It's, they have an acronym department that probably has initials to stamp. Don't just use it and, and not spell it out. Spell it out at least once so people know what you're talking about. And give it to somebody else to read. Somebody who you don't work next door to, who already knows exactly what you're writing about. Give it to somebody who doesn't work with you, who can tell you things like, I don't understand. What, why is this so important? It's not clear to me. Did you know you spelled this person's name three different ways? Did you know that you asked for $10,000 on page one and $8,000 on page three? They will tell you things that spell check just does not pick up and that you don't see because you've looked at it too much. Give it to somebody else to give you a clear view because you don't know who's going to be reading it. Board I was on, board, uh, board of the foundation that I work for, it was led by the, the wife of the person who started the foundation. She was 92. And she had lived in Lorraine her entire life. And it was also a board that had her granddaughter, who lived in Arizona, who had never been to Lorraine in her entire life. Both of these people had an equal vote. So you can't assume that everybody's going to see things exactly the same way. All right. Let's talk about how this generally goes. And we'll follow along with this as we go through it. First part of a grant proposal, the first most important part, uh, usually the executive summary goes on top, but you don't write that first. You write it last, and I'll talk more about that. Statement of need is the most important part. And I want to define the word need here. Need is not, I need to hire somebody. Need is not, I need a copy machine. It's not your need that we're talking about in the statement of need. It's the need that you are responding to in the community. That's what a statement of need is. The problem or issue that you're going to address. They found a couple of needs in their community here. Many students are reading below grade level. Senior citizens are in need of meaningful work opportunities. Two needs. You can talk about these needs, but the thing to do to, to make sure that, that the person reading it will pay attention 
is to, is to make sure you root it in the community. Give me some information to back that up. Where would you get information about many students reading below grade level in your community? Where would you get it? The school, yeah. Yeah, if you're working with a school, you can test scores. You can go to the Board of Education and get test scores too. You can get it. How about seniors in need of meaningful work opportunities? Where would you get that? Senior Community Center? Yeah. Maybe you run a community center and you have stats that you've gathered. We survey uh, our residents every year and 75% say they wish they had more to do. You can draw on your own stats. You can draw on stuff that AARP or the Area Agency on Aging puts together. You can go to the library and find out what's the best resources around here to find out about the need in my community. I want to show that my community is, is uh, over 50% poverty level. Where can I find that? Well, you can find it from census statistics, from other things that have been gathered. The library knows crime statistics, all sorts of different things that you could support. The important thing is to not just make it something that you say is a problem, but to draw it from information outside. Now, that information doesn't have to be all the same dull list of statistics. You could bring in for information from surveys that you've done. You can put a picture, put a face on it. So you have some statistics that back you up. You can also have facts. Jim, Jim is a typical resident of our senior center. Jim sits and watches 80 hours of television a week. You know, you could put a face on this. Explain why this is an issue and back it up. Don't go too broad. Poverty is a nationwide issue. Yeah, that's, it is. Poverty is a nationwide issue, and you can prove that. But what impact are you going to have in your area? And the poverty level in Hudson is different than the poverty level in Stowe, is different than the poverty level in Kent. Where are you serving? That's what they're going to want to know. Where are you going to have an impact? So use this in the first couple of pages to really talk about the issue. I, I will tell you that if you look and you get too focused on what you need, you will never find a funder that's going to come off and say, I want to pay for staff. That's what I set up this foundation to do, is pay for staff. They're going to say what they want to change in the community. What impact are you having there, too? So that's where you start with a grant proposal, is the need. First couple of pages, talking about what you've discovered. The next part, it's, it's tempting once you do that, to then start saying, well, OK, first we're going to do this. And next we're going to do this, and then, then we're going to do this, and this, and this, and just go through and talk about what you want to do. Back up a little bit before you get into that. Once you start describing the project, and there's a lot of parts to the project description, so I'm going to talk about each one of them. Once you start describing the project, talk broadly about it first. What are the broad things you're aiming for, the goals? This one has two broad goals. To increase the reading levels for students and to provide meaningful, rewarding volunteer work opportunities for seniors. Just list them out. And by the way, bullet points, indenting, headings like this, especially headings that they've suggested. You know, I'm talking about writing a master proposal that you modify. But if the funder says, uses a different word than goals, if they say, tell us three things that you hope this project will accomplish, you can use that and use, here are three things. You can use the words that they use. But make it readable. Don't go for packing as many words as possible into an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Somebody has to read it and absorb it, so be merciful to them. Indenting, white space, headlines, underlines, anything. Couple of goals, and then underneath the goals, what specific things are you going to get done? What are your objectives? And I told you not to use acronyms, but remember this acronym, SMART, because it's very important. Every objective should be Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, time-limited. So for example, in this one, we want to recruit 20 students, grades 3 through 6, who are below grade level in reading. That's the first thing they want to get done. That's the first thing they can say, well, we took that first step. Second objective, to increase the reading levels of at least 75% of their participants to their grade level in one year. Why not 100%? Not realistic, yeah, yeah. Are you going to be able to do that? You don't want to promise something that you can't deliver. Don't promise the impossible. But at the same time, don't be vague. We hope to raise the reading levels of a lot of those kids. Why am I going to get excited about that? Pick 
a level that you're going to bring it to. Pick a benchmark that you're moving toward. And don't forget about all the goals that you have. You have objectives related to the students. You also want to recruit, train, and retain at least 20 seniors as tutors for one year. So by the end of this year, all of these are what you're hoping to have met. Later on, in the project description, when you talk about evaluating your success, you go back to those objectives. And that's what you evaluate, one of the things that you evaluate. Start with the broad goals. Begin to talk about the specific objectives you're going to get done. Then you can get into the methods section. And this, by the way, this whole part I consider to be one thing, the methods section. Staffing, collaboration, replicability. Methods, I, I like to think of this section as something that you could do as a timeline. You're writing a grant proposal. Here's the objectives we want to get done. Here's the methods. During the first three months, this is what's going to happen. During the next three months, this is what's going to happen. Take me through the whole process. A uh, little secret about grant proposals. People don't have trouble having ideas and coming up with goals and objectives so much. If you've never done it before, this is what's going to trip you up. Because you have to be able to describe how it is going to work from beginning to end, even if you haven't done it before. And funders are going to read this, and they're going to look for things. Huh. So you have seniors over here at the senior center. And you have students over here at the school. How are they going to get together? You know, I actually had a conversation with a grant seeker one time, and, they, and it, was for, it was actually not for a program like this. It was for a theater program. And they were going to have the kids from Rain County come down to the theater, which was in Cleveland, and see these educational things. Sounded like a great program. And I said, how do the students get from the schools to the theater? And they said, oh, the schools are going to give them buses. I'm like, really? They're just going to give them buses. It's just how that happens, is they have the buses laying around and they just stand. No, I didn't, wasn't mean, but that's the thing. You, you want to think it through. Schools don't just have buses laying around. You have to work to make that happen. If you're going to collaborate with schools, you have to have a clear understanding of what's going to happen on each end. This program doesn't happen unless there's a collaboration between a school and a senior center in this organization, where, whoever they are. What does it mean? What does this phrase mean? We hope to work with a local senior center. It means you don't. It means you haven't thought it through. And that's dangerous. It's always dangerous to say, well, you know, you give us the money and then we'll work it out. That's not, that's not what they want. They want you to have thought it through. They want you to talk about who's going to be doing the work. Who's going to be staffing this project? You're going to double the number of people you're going to serve? Explain to me how that's going to happen with your current staff. Or do you have to hire somebody? And if you do, that's part of your timeline, because you don't hire somebody on the first day. You have to work that into your timeline. So think about how this really happens from beginning to end. If you've modeled it on something else, repli it's replicating something else. That's good. You can cite that. Well, we're basing this on a program we did three years ago. It had an 80% success rate. We're, you know, we're, basing, we're modeling this. Funders love to see things that could be models for other people. And they like to see when you use a structure you know is going to work. But make it so that they can't find the holes in it. Think it through that much. So you talk about what you're going to do, talk about the need you're responding, and how you're going to start doing the work, how it's going to go from beginning to end. Next thing you want to talk about is how are you going to be able to tell whether you're successful at it or not. And funders, private foundations, generally don't want you to hire an outside evaluation team. They want you to do this yourself as part of the project program design. And sometimes it's pretty straightforward. OK, you want to raise the test scores. You want to raise the reading levels of these students. So you test them at the beginning, and they score down here. And you test them at the end, and they score up here. So that tells you, you know, before and after test. What it doesn't tell you, and that's, you know, that's measuring the outcome. It doesn't tell you what happened in the middle. So I'm, anybody ever worked in a mentoring or tutoring program out there? Yeah, mentors and mentees always perfectly match first time, right? No problem. No. no, of course not. It's something that happens. You get these, these matches, and then you find out after the first meeting that I can't work with him, and he can't work with her. And they, it just, there has to be a way of getting feedback. And that's formative measurement. That's putting in place ways of getting feedback on how things are going. 
So in, in addition to the, the pre and the post test for this program, they have student folders with progressive work examples. The kids write in a folder every time they, they come for their session, and then the next session they work on the things that they couldn't do. They build to that higher reading level. And you have these volunteer and staff meetings. Everybody gets together after the first session and talks about, did everything work right? Well, the bus was late and uh, my kid left and it didn't work. You don't want that to be the end of the program. You want to keep getting feedback so you can fix things. That's what analyzing the process means, having that in place so that you can get from this point to that point. And don't forget about the other things that you wanted to mention. You want to have the students reading at a higher level, yes, but you also want to give the seniors a rewarding time. And you can't test them to see, were you rewarded? You know, you know, it's like not like that. But you can survey them. You can approach them and follow up with them. Find out what makes the most sense for yours. And um, I'll show you at the end. We have a, a free website that has, in addition to some other great information, evaluation tools. So if you've run into a dead end, you don't know how to evaluate the success or the impact of your program. Arts programs run into that all the time. We have a set of a collection, a free collection of tools that might help you. OK, so you go through all this, and you write most of the project description, and then you have to talk about how you're going to pay for it. This is something where you talk about how you're going to pay for it now and how you're going to pay for it down the road. And those are kind of different things, because different projects require different amounts of discussion of this. If you have a finite project, say you have to renovate your building. Once you renovate it, it's done. So you don't have things down the line. You just have plans for this year. Well, we're going to get a grant from you, hopefully, and we're going to get this money and that money and the other money, and that's how it's going to be paid for. And next year, it's going to be maintained by regular income from the organization, whatever. That's one way. Maybe it's something that you can start charging for. So you do have a theater program, and you are renovating the space, and you're going to buy costumes, and you're going to buy set, put sets together, and you're going to begin to put on productions. And then it could move towards self-sufficiency. You charge for popcorn. You charge for admission. You charge for ads in the program. And it pays for itself. That's another way it could go. But most likely, it's going to be something where you're going to have to piece it together from lots of different things. You're going to raise money this year from the foundation to pay for this, and you're going to go to other places and maybe get some individual donations. Maybe you're going to charge for certain things. And next year, you're hoping to have more coming in from outside, or you're going to go to other. You have to have a plan. It doesn't have to be perfect, because you don't know what's going to happen next year. But you have an idea. If you don't have an idea, a funder is going to assume you're going to go to them this year and keep going to them until they get sick of you. And that's not the good plan. Foundations love to be responsive, but they hate to be a line item on your budget. They want to, and that's why they ask you, you know, if you keep going back to them year after year, what are you doing new? Why is this different? Why should I keep helping you? How is this expanding? How is it growing? You know, not, you don't want, they don't want you to invent something new. They want you to tell them why they should still be connected. Why isn't this self-sufficient? Question. Sure. Sure. I mean, you can. I make the foundations sound horrible. You know that they were going to give you money for three years and then cut you off dead. It's not going to work that way necessarily. Especially not if they like what you're doing. They might help other projects. They might say, "Well, what what's a good fit for us this year?" And they talk to you. But there's also, and I, I can tell you, this happened. I've heard this a lot of different times. Is that foundations will take a look at an organization that keeps coming back to them for the same thing over and over again. And they will say, you know what? Maybe it's time we gave them a break. Hmm. You know what that means? It's like, we're going to give you a break. It sounds great, doesn't it? We're going to give you a break. We're not going to fund you this year. And then you have to find that money from somewhere. And that can be very hard. Or they'll give you something like a challenge grant. We don't think that you're really using our money to leverage other money, which is what they, they like you to do, to help you get, you know, you get our grant, but we want you to go out and be able to get other grants, too. So we're going to give you a challenge. You have to go get other grants before we'll give you any money. Because those things will happen. So getting complacent is a bad situation. All right. So you've gone through and you've written the narrative, essentially. There's a little bit more. But this is essentially the story that you are telling. You'll talk a little bit about yourself. But right now is when you usually insert the budget. The budget. OK. 
Everybody ready to deal with the budget? You have coffee? You're all right. Okay. Budget is the most important part of the grant proposal. It's what some funders turn to first. I've, I've seen this, where they, you know, they get a grant proposal, they look at the title, and they turn to the budget. They can understand what the project is just from looking at that budget. And if they can't, that's a bad thing. So the, and I would love to be able to say that, that budgets are all, you know, they should be this one way. But there are so many different ways to do a budget. I'm going to give you a general idea and, and one thing that you should keep in mind when you do a budget. Eliminate questions. You create a budget, the funder, and I guarantee you this happens at the, at the, the uh, meeting where they decide who gets grants. They'll look at that budget line by line and they'll say, what's this for? Why is this essential? Did they need this? So you have to look at your budget with that same kind of pressure and say, does this make sense? Does it explain itself? What you use to make it a little bit easier, wait, I have a pointer, budget narrative. Budget narrative is vital. Budget narrative is anything you add to a grant budget that explains why is this important and where did you get this number. So you never put something like other $50,000 without explanation. You never put anything where it's not clear. You always want to have a little footnote, a little parentheses next to it that shows what it is and why it's important and explains, you know, computer, $20,000. This is for a special graphing computer. Never put computer $20,000 without explaining, explaining exactly what it is. Budgets are really made up of two different parts. There's the expenses, which most people think of as the budget, what you're going to spend specifically for the project, and then the income, the same amount, where that money is coming in. And a lot of funders will ask to see both. Most of them, almost all of them, are going to ask to see the expenses. Some of them are going to ask you tell me where the money to meet those expenses is coming from. And they'll ask you to put numbers to your sustainability plan. The expenses are the most important part, though. You have to be clear that everything that you need to buy within that you've written in the narrative is clearly delineated in the budget. And that includes direct and indirect costs, direct costs being everything that is directly necessary for the project you have to have in order to do this project. And that includes personnel and non-personnel. Personnel is everybody who works for you that's working on the project. And you know, if you work for a nonprofit, that people who work for nonprofits don't just do one job, usually. It's all sorts of different jobs. So you have to think about how much time are they spending on this. We have an executive director on this exam. There's a tiny little budget at the bottom of this one. Executive director for this project, this executive director works for this organization, makes $60,000 a year, whatever he does, whatever she does. But they spend 5% of their time on this project, supervising it, doing things related to it. So they should get, from this project, 5% of their salary. 5% of 60,000 is 3,000. That's where that number comes from. The project coordinator spends a third of their time on this project, and they get $42,000 a year, so they should get a third of that from this project. Everybody see how that follows? But that's not the total cost of personnel. For most organizations, in addition to paying people money, paying personnel their salary, you pay to the state, to insurance companies, you pay for benefits. That's different for every organization. And that's why, by the way, when you do a budget, I told you to show the grant proposal to somebody who you don't work with, show the budget or work with the financial person in your organization and show them the budget. Make sure they see it and make sure they approve of it. And they can tell you what the fringe benefit rate is for your organization, because it's different for every one. You spend, in your organization, $100,000 on salary. And you spend $20,000 paying insurance companies and paying for the state and the different taxes and things that you have to pay to have people work for you. $20,000 for that, $100,000 for salary. So your fringe benefit rate is 20%, 20 into 100000 See how that comes out? Everybody, every organization's fringe benefit rate is different. Often, it's much more than that. But if you don't put that in, so we have a line there for fringe, and there's this 20%. 20% times 17,000, which is the total salaries, is 3,400. So the real total cost of personnel is 20,400. If you don't use that number rather than the number without benefits, you're not really representing the total cost of these people. And you have to go somewhere else 
to get the fringe benefit rate. And I'll tell you, there are not going to be foundations eager to pay for your fringe benefits. They want to pay for the real cost of your programs. That includes all the stuff related to personnel. In addition to personnel, as a direct cost, you have uh, non-personnel costs. Non-personnel costs is everything else you have to buy for the project. That can include people, like consultants. Consultants are not personnel because they don't work for you. You hire them on an hourly, daily basis. So you could list them that way. And you have things like supplies and printing and transportation. All of these things have to be for the program, directly for the program. So it's not a phone. You have a phone on here, phone, $1,000. Phone line installed specifically for this project. That's what it should say there. Tell me specifically why this is directly necessary for the project. That's what direct costs are, everything you have to buy for the project. It can be, can be room you have to rent. It can be things you have to acquire. But all the costs that are not employees, that are not personnel, you have to list that out. So you come with, up with a total of 40400 That's the total cost of total direct costs. Personnel, non-personnel. But then there's indirect costs. People know what this is? Other word for it, overhead, support services, administrative costs, all the same. It's the cost of doing business. Every organization, just like every organization has a different fringe benefit rate, every organization has a different cost of doing business. And your finance person, if they file your 990 with the IRS, they'll know what that cost is because it's something you have to turn in on the 990. You wonder at uh, the holidays where people get your, your charity dollar. For every dollar you give to XYZ charity, 50 cents of that goes to fundraising. How do they get that? It's public knowledge. It's published with their 990 in the IRS. What they spend on direct costs, program costs, and what they spend on support services and fundraising. Support services and fundraising are overhead or indirect costs. Here's another way to calculate it. This is just a calculation for another nonprofit. All their direct costs for their programs add up to 500000 And their indirect costs, the cost of the rent for the whole organization, the cost of the utilities for the organization as a whole, the cost of copy machine, toner, office supplies, administrative staff, that adds up to 100000 Everything that's not directly necessary for the projects, but that you have to pay for to keep the place going. That's indirect cost. Question. Will that not go into your personnel? That's a. Right. You can't put it under your indirect cost. You can't put it in your personnel for the, for the administrative staff. Administrative staff. Will they go personnel or will they go personnel? She's asking where would you put, you know, is, would that not go into personnel? Okay, so you have an executive director. If they're working on the project, you can put them in direct cost because they're working directly on it. But a human resources person that hires, are not work, they're not working directly on the project. They're part of your indirect costs. It's something that, I'm, I'm, there are like wheels within wheels for this, so there's no perfect way to do it. But the way I think about it is if anybody is applying themselves directly to the work of the project, they are not indirect, they are direct. Make sense? Not a lawyer or an accountant, by the way. So, yes. Yeah. How detailed do you, do he say, he's saying, how detailed do you have to be to back it all up? I would say that you have to know, you have to be able to explain where the number comes from. If you say rent, uh, if you're doing something and you're listing a rent, you have to say where that number, you're not just picking the number out of thin air. Well, this is the average cost of a space in this t part of town. You, you price out computers, get a couple of estimates and be, be ready to back it up. Isn't budget fun? It's so much fun. You're having fun, right? It looks like fun. OK. I shouldn't push this too far. OK. Expenses. That's one part of your, your proposal. The income, they may ask for you to put that on, a, on the same sheet. And I don't have an example for you. Oh, I'm, before I get done with the expenses, though. Indirect costs, I told you, different for every organization. The example that I showed you, it's indirect cost rate of 20%. You can put that as a line item, like they do in this budget. Indirect costs, they have 15% for theirs. 
15% multiplied by 40,400 is 6,060. So you get 46,460. That's the real total cost. You could do it that way, but I, I would recommend against a single line. I would put either budget narrative or br a breakdown so that a funder looking at this will say, well, that indirect cost, what's entailed in that? And you can explain this is $1,000 towards rent, $1,000 towards utilities, $1,000 towards administrative staff. You can explain where that number comes from. Income, you can just lay out as a table. And I, like I said, I don't have an, an example. But I can think of it very simple. You know, you're writing to the XYZ Foundation. XYZ Foundation, $10,000 pending. It's the first part of your table. That's the request you're writing now. Other foundations, you can use categories for the rest of it. Other foundations, $10,000. Committed, meaning you have $10,000 in hand. Golf event, May 2014, estimated $5,000. Want, they want to know two things out of that. They want to know where else you're going to get the money, and they want to know how much you have. And that's important, because you're asking for $100,000, and you have nothing, it's a lot harder to get funding for that than if you're asking for $100,000 and you have 50,000 of that committed already. Funder is more likely to give to you if it looks like it's going to happen. So you want to let them know how much you have on hand. And that includes if there's in-kind donations. You know what in-kind is. It's anything other than money that you've gotten. Volunteers, uh, items, computers, free rent. What has been donated? You know, if we donated the buses for the transportation for the seniors here. You want to put a little footnote saying this is a donated from the Bluebird Bus Company, $1,000. That's income and expense, because if you didn't get it donated, you'd have to account for it. But question in the very back. Yeah, you can estimate it out, and that makes it pending. So you, you haven't got it committed. I would like to say that there's, there's not one way to show where the income is coming from. But at some point, you have to address that. You know? And they're going to expect that you're asking a lot of different places for money. That's why I t tend not to list out all the foundations I'm going to go to. Because what if some of them say no? Then I have to get more. So if I just say I expect to get $10,000 from foundations, it doesn't tell me which ones. And it tells them, oh, you're going to put it together, some from foundations, some from here, some from there. And it tells that story. Question? I tend to indicate status just so the funder knows how much you have on hand. At some point, you, they're going to ask, so you might as well. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, you may not know. I mean, I would just say pending. You know, pending is a good broad term. App, yeah, have applied, you know, something like that. All right. It's basically all downhill after the budget. <laughs> Not in a negative way, a good way. So you have the program, you have that written out, you have the budget. There's a page that you should insert about why it should be you that does this. That's what the organizational information, oh, this is a great idea. I like the budget, too. Who are these people? It's a page that I would not write from scratch every time I wrote a grant proposal. In fact, I had it on my desktop. I just inserted it into every grant proposal I wrote. And then um, I would revise it. I would keep it up to date. It would tell the most important things about my organization, our mission and history, the programs we're known for. If I was new and we didn't have a lot of programs, I would talk more about the history of the board and the board president and the key staff members. But you want to just communicate that if they invest in you, if they give you money, that they, you're going to be able to do something with it. So here's why it should be us that does it. Insert that in. The very end, you usually have a conclusion. It's not something you really should agonize over. Last couple of paragraphs. Just where you make the final plea. Remember that your gift will ensure that 100 children won't go hungry this year. Don't, don't work for the most perfect ending, because it doesn't get read all that much. You know, people read through the grant proposal. They study the budget. When they really want to know about this grant proposal over and over again, though, they read the executive summary. 
And different funders ask for different things, you know, put it on an application form. In 200 words, tell us exactly what you're going to do. That's, you know, your summary, your executive summary. I think of this as like a one pager that would go on top. And it tells the whole story of the grant proposal. You write it at the end after you're clear on exactly what's going to happen. And you say, here's the need I'm responding to. Here are our goals and objectives. Here's how much it's going to cost and how much we want from you. And here's a little bit of background on us. You put that on top, and your whole proposal gets read a few times. Your executive summary gets read over and over and over again until it's clear in their head. So get this. If you spend any time on any of the narrative, spend time on this, making it clear. Because they will look at it again and again. That goes on top. At the end go all these things. Different for every organization, but generally they have the IRS determination letter, proof of nonprofit status, financial documents. Sometimes they ask for an audit. Maybe you don't have an audit. Then they say you can send in a financial review or a 990. Find out what they want and send them what they want. If you can't send them what they want, try and find out from them what they, you can send instead. Don't just not include it, because that's a good way to get your grant proposal ignored. If they want a board and staff list, include that. If they ask for things like annual reports, include them. If they don't ask for them, don't throw everything in there, because it probably won't get looked at. You know, don't throw a DVD in there, because it tells your story so great. They'll put the DVD on the shelf, because they have to send this grant proposal to all sorts of different people, and it might not get watched. If you want to tell them about a DVD, if you want to tell them about something that you want them to look at, Put that in the cover letter. The cover letter goes on top, and most people toss this off right before they submit the grant proposal. You shouldn't do that, because the cover letter is really the only place where you can say, why am I applying to you specifically? I'm sending you this grant proposal, but I'm approaching the Morgan Foundation because of your longstanding support for X. Thank you for speaking to me the other day and encouraging me to submit this. You can build on this relationship. You can say things like, thank you for being a longtime supporter of our organization, if, if they have been. Remind them of the relationship. That's what the cover letter is, is best at. Question in the back. I would put it just about anywhere. I wouldn't, I wouldn't save it to the conclusion. It should be in the cover letter, most likely. You know, in close, please find a request for $5,000 from us. And then it sh definitely should be the executive summary as well. I have heard complaints from funders that say, I can't find where the money request is. I know it's in here somewhere. So it seems rude to put it right there in front, but it makes their job easy. So yeah. put it in there. You don't have to make it in bigger type than everything else. The, the cover letter is not an executive summary. It's just talking more specifically about the relationship. You might summarize in one sentence or two sentences what your grant proposal is about. But the executive summary does a lot more than that. This just simply says, thank you for encouraging me. Here's why. I'm closed. Please find our request for $4,000 for this particular program. We are happy to answer any questions. And maybe this is signed by the executive director. But if that's not the right person to talk to, you need their contact information in there. Because they will go back to this cover letter. And they'll look at this first thing they see. So they'll look at it. Goes on top of the proposal, staple, paper clip, binder clip, nothing fancy, submitted to them. Follow their directions, by the way. Some of them have an application form they want you to submit. Some of them have their own. Some of them have. Uh, a common one that's shared among grant makers, find out what they need. And don't skip that initial contact. I mentioned that earlier. If they say call first before submitting, definitely do that. Because if you ignore their direct directives, that's the quickest way for them to say no. You know, well, I put you aside because you didn't follow directions. You don't want that. And follow their guidelines. Get it in early if you can, because if you make a mistake, which I did all the time, I swear, I made so many phone calls where like, you know that number at the bottom of that column? Well, that's not right. You want to change that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to hurry up and send it in and find out you make mistakes. Get it in early, and you, you, you're ready for changes, and they have time to make changes. Question, another question in the back. Yeah. Only. Right. When you say early, you're saying get it in on the 
Yes, that's what I mean. Exactly. Yeah, in, in that time. Sometimes they just have one deadline. Don't wait till 5 o'clock on that day. It's a bad thing. Everything I'm seeing here is for an established FPO. Is this applicable also to people that just started an FPO? Okay, so he's asking if you, do, you don't have a nonprofit yet. This is for an established nonprofit. Right. You're starting a nonprofit. Can you go through this process? It makes it even more important for you to contact the funder first and to get some feedback. If you don't have your 501c3, there are some funders that won't even look at anything. There are others that say, well, you know what? You'll need to partner with someone while you're getting your 501c3. You'll need to partner with an established nonprofit and apply under their auspices. And then there are some, because it is legal for them to give a grant to you while you're in the process, some of them will accept it, but most of them want that f little form. They want that 501c3. So make sure you check ahead of time. Comment, also. What if a nonprofit is formed out of a school program? So okay. If you had a community-based theater program in the school, which sure. is now more to the community. Okay. Still tied to the school, we're still getting some funding from the school. Do you have your independent 501c3? We've applied. We've applied. Chances are you will probably have to stay under the school for a little while longer. Yeah, if they're okay with it. And they share, you share their finances until you get your own and then you share your own. We're telling our story, is it okay to people who come to school? Absolutely. Support. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, finish up here. After you submit it, there is follow-up. You do build relationships with the funder. Remember, all they have is what you just sent them. So if you get more money, you only had $5,000 when you sent it, now you have $35,000. They'll need to know that before they make their decision. So keep them updated, not daily, but keep them updated when things change, and at least a week before they make their decision. I usually called about a week to 10 days after I submitted the grant proposal just to make sure they had everything they needed, find out when they're going to make their decision. And this was also a time when if we had a board member that knew one of their board members, they might make a little phone call, not to circumvent the whole process, but to add support. I, I, you know what, I, I, you know, this is a, a board member on our board that's friends with one of their board member. So they'd make a little call. They'd say, I just wanted to call in, and I know that you're considering a grant proposal from an organization I'm on the board of. I think it's a great organization. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I hope you'll support it. Does that work? Sometimes. Is it necessary? No. But it does help, because remember, this is a very personal decision. And any time that they can trust the organization and know that they can go somewhere and ask questions, they will feel better about it. So it is personal, personal connections do make a difference. You're trying to make personal connections with all of these funders. Doesn't guarantee funding, but it helps, because then they know who to ask questions of. Do all this kind of stuff, do everything right, and they say yes, that's great. Send a thank you letter, make sure you got what you asked for, and make sure to clarify if you didn't. And keep them informed, because you're probably going to go back to them. Maybe not for the same thing, but they like you, they funded you, you want to keep them updated on what's going on. Don't treat them like a cash machine. Go back to them, and don't reintroduce yourself, because you, they have already know you, you've kept up with them. If they say no, do not call them up and scream at them. This is a bad idea. Um, you will feel like calling them up and screaming at them. Hold back just a few days, maybe, until you can call them up and thank them for considering you. I was a little disappointed that we didn't get the grant. I just wanted to know if you had any feedback for me. And sometimes they'll say, well, we just had so many great requests, we couldn't fund everybody. And sometimes that's the truth. But sometimes they'll also say, you know what, we just thought it was a, the program's a little new. You know, you haven't really established yourself. Oh, well, could we come back maybe next year? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Then you move on. They're not going to change your mind. You're not going to call them up and say, you know, you really should have given us this money. Do not call them up and complain when you get a grant either. You didn't give us what we asked for. No, I didn't. Uh, you know, it's that kind of thing. But it's keep the relationship on the up and up, because you never know when you're going to go back to them. And if they say no, or they say, you know what, this is really not a good fit for us, we've considered it, seemed like a good idea, that's why we encouraged you, but no, move on. Find other funders that you do fit with. You can't force this to happen. So move on. You can get help from us. 
we have our library, the cooperating collections or the funding information network. Libraries like this one have our resources, have our database that you can use. And then there's a website called Grantspace. I'm just going to bring up real quick here. Grantspace, this is Grantspace. It's free from anywhere, by the way. Grantspace.org, free from anywhere. You can find a lot of free information on here. One thing you can find is a place where you can search to find where the nearest location is. So if you enter your zip code, somebody give me a zip code. 44323? 4323. 3323. I don't know that one. What's that? Okay. 44333, what's the closest library that has free access to the foundation directory? Akron Summit County Public Library, BVU, Center for Nonprofit Excellence. Library, Twinsburg, Cuyahoga County and in Independence, Cuyahoga County and Berea. All of these are places you can use our database for free. So you can put in your zip code on any of the Grantspace pages and find us. You can also use Grantspace to find information and we try and put as much good free information on here as we can, different areas. One place I'll point out to you and I would encourage you to explore is the tools section. Tools section is free databases of information, including a free collection of sample documents, sample budgets, cover letters, full proposals that you can download. They've all been funded. They're all good examples. We've made them available, taking them from our own collection. Also, a knowledge base collection of articles. If you want to know how to do something, you can search in here. You want to write a letter of inquiry. What's that? Find out what a letter of inquiry is and how to do it. <coughs> what should be included in a letter of inquiry. That's a short version of your grant proposal. Here's what should be in it. Here's where you can download samples. And here are some great websites that we've identified that have good information related to this. Rather than putting grants into Google and getting, I don't know what, we've gone through and found the best things and rated the best ones, put them at the top. The other thing that's in here in the tools is what I mentioned earlier, um, our database of evaluation tools. So down here on that same page is tools and resources for measuring social impact, measuring the impact of your program, measuring the impact your program has on the community. Free tools, about 600 of them, that you can download and use to measure success in the program. So if you don't have those tools, you can find them on your search to find the ones that make the most sense for you. It's all free stuff. Lots of good things. If you have people that are starting up nonprofits, by the way, there's a, there's a whole section at the very bottom for startup resources by state because it's different in every state. The free database as well. But grant space is where we collect all that kind of stuff. Perhaps. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And don't forget to register for, do they have to register for the class on Saturday if you want? They're going fast.